Welcome back, AP, and welcome back to the Chip Chat Room, right? I really like the acoustics in this room. Bless yet again, my classroom is used during F period, so I have to come here to do some of my flips. But it's not a big deal because they have these really, really comfortable chairs. Um, now, big thing to kind of understand what we're doing right now, uh, we are kind of leaving the art sphere of the Renaissance. You need to leave space in your notes. It's an AP class. You need to be prepared to have some incontinuity in your notes and stuff. It's not that big of a deal. You're going to be fine. So the big thing going into this, though, make sure you leave that space. And we're now going to be talking about kind of like this entire time we've been talking about the economics of the Renaissance, the technology of the Renaissance, the innovative uh, learning of the Renaissance, the visual arts of the Renaissance. But what we haven't talked about is how the Renaissance affected everybody else, right? How did it affect the social hierarchies of the world, the middle class, the, the uh, slave labor class? Like, how did it affect all of these other different people? So what we're getting into now is, like, the social hierarchy of the Renaissance period and the rise of these things that we like to call in AP Euro the new monarchies, right? So what I need you to do for me for a hot second is in that title, underline new monarchies or highlight new monarchies or circle it like eight times. I don't really care, all right? So, but it's a very important concept that you need to make sure that you can reference back to at any given time, okay? So really quick thing so you understand, due to the Renaissance, as you could tell, right, when we were talking about the Inferno and the visual arts and when we get into the High Renaissance tomorrow and then the Northern Renaissance later, Later. What you're starting to realize is that a large gap is starting to, to grow, right? Because the influx of this new economy into Europe is causing the upper classes to gain a massive amount of goods. But the middle classes, yes, are growing slightly, but the middle class really didn't exist in the Middle Ages, right? So for the lower classes, the uneducated, the like poorer end, the Renaissance didn't change much for them, and I need you to jot that down for me really fast. Like Life for a regular person during the Renaissance didn't really change much at all, right? They were still expected to work. They were still going to expect hard times. They were still going to expect uh, having to pay off certain things. They were still going to expect to not be able to necessarily read and write. Literacy rates did go up, but they didn't go up across the board, right? So we have to understand that like really when we're talking about the Renaissance right now, we're mainly talking about the growth of the Renaissance period for the wealthy and the affluent and the influenced, right? So that is a huge thing for all of us to understand. Now there is another class though. So we talked about how like the Renaissance is gonna be a game changer for the wealthy. We got visual arts, intelligence, uh, access to education, women seeking more rights, da 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 For the poor, it's like they're just kind of there. You know what I mean? Like they're still living the life that they probably would have in the Middle Ages because here's the big thing. Feudalism still existed, right? I need you to jot that down. Feudalism still exists in Europe. It is not gone with the Renaissance. Now, the profitability of feudalism is taking a hit because the Renaissance economy is changing the game dramatically, but feudalism still exists. It's still a component of Renaissance society, right? Now, the hidden thing, though, is this concept of race and slavery. So we've been talking this entire time about white Europeans, particularly in Italy, and the amount of influence that the Renaissance is going to have on them, right? We've been talking about with like starting tomorrow we're going to start talking about how it's going to expand into the northern territories and how it's going to create more of a kind of a european trend instead of just an italian trend but you got to remember that there were subservient classes that existed in renaissance italy and europe as well and slavery was an active thing that was going on in renaissance europe right so you have to understand that very few, during this time period, during the late 1400s, early 1500s, very few African descendant people existed or resided in Europe. Most people that were Africans that lived in Europe were brought over as slaves along with larger groups of white slaves, right? So the very first groups of slaves to be coming to Europe were a mixture of white and African, mostly from North Africa, slaves, right? Now, the big reason behind this is due to the fact that this slavery trade is going to be more prevalent in the Middle East at first, usually coming out of the Ottoman Empire, the formerly Byzantine Empire. And the word slave itself, S-L-A-V-E, is actually a derivative 
of the word that Western Europeaners used to refer to people from Eastern Europe as a Slav, right? The word Slav actually is the origin of the word slave, right? So the very first groups of slaves to make their way to Europe was a mixture of Eastern European white slaves, also some slaves from the North African region such as Morocco, Angola, Tunisia, Libya, and Egypt as well, right? So the big thing to also understand is that with this prevalence of slavery, it was not nearly as widespread as one thinks. It was very rare to see an African descendant person in Europe, but it still was a thing because here's the, the big kicker out of all of it. Around 1453, when Constantinople falls, okay, it says Byzantine fell, and next to that put Constantinople. When the capital of the Byzantine falls to the Ottoman Turks and it becomes the Ottoman Empire, write that transition, right? Give me like a little arrow underneath this piece of information where it's like, in 1453, the Byzantine Empire falls and creates itself into the Ottoman Empire, right? So when that happens, slavery is going to take a massive step forward. You're going to see an influx of slaves coming in, mainly due to the fact that the Portuguese are going to start trying to figure out ways to get to India on a different route, right? And we're going to start talking about that in the next part of this unit when we talk about exploration and the, uh, the, the European period of exploration, right? But the big thing to understand is the Portuguese are trying to find faster routes to get to India. So they start mapping the exterior around Africa, right? And so when they start mapping a route around Africa to get to India on the other side to become a part of this spice trade, they start actually creating slave forts and pickup spots for slaves around Europe or around Africa, right? So you're going to see a massive influx and a boom in the number of slaves being brought to Europe during the time period. Not as big as you might think, not as like active, not like every single household actually was home to a, an, an African descendant slave. That was very, very rare still. But here's a thing to just show you what I'm talking about. Around 1500, just 50 years after the fall of Constantinople, only about a thousand slaves a year were brought to Portugal. Again, mixed in from white Eastern European slaves and then African slaves as well. By 1530, that number grew to 10,000 a year mostly African slaves, right? So this is a very intense thing to understand that the European progression through history, especially during this Renaissance period, does not necessarily mean they were the most enlightened people on the planet because they tried to rationalize this idea and they began to enslave people at a very high rate, right? Look, that's 10 times the amount of people per year in just 30 years, right? So continuing forward though, what you think of as slavery, though, didn't really exist until the 1600s, right? The late 1600s at that. This big, large-scale agricultural slavery, which is usually what you learn from, like, American history classes, right? So that didn't develop until the 1600s, and when it did develop eventually, that was focused mostly in the New World, particularly in the Sugar Islands in the Caribbean, places like the Dominican Republic, Cuba and things like that to grow sugarcane, also in Brazil, and then later on to grow things like rice in South Carolina, right? So the big, large agricultural slavery didn't really exist until a lot, like much, like a much further time away. However, slaves did exist in Europe, right? And in this Renaissance period, they were not perfect, okay? Because slavery was an aspect of their society. Slaves used to do everything in European cities, everything from uh, like cleaning houses, being uh, like caretakers for children, just kind of like more urban-centered slave labor, right? And there's actually a very, very, very intense series of books that actually have to do with the African experience in Renaissance Europe, right? Which is a very, very important thing to understand is that there was a presence of African people in Europe during this Renaissance period, right? So the other big kind of sketchy part about it is like even religious institutions are going to begin to condone this slave trade, right? Because the Catholic Church starts kind of pitching this idea of like, oh, well, this will improve the lives of these Africans, which we know is not necessarily going to be true. And that is mainly just to further the economic gains of the Catholic Church at the time. Now, I said at the time. I'm not saying that like Pope Francis is about this. That's not true, okay? So now you also have to understand that wealth and nobility is very, very prevalent still, right? During the Renaissance period, you basically had two classes. 
the wealth nobility class, and then the everybody else. And the king during the Middle Ages was kind of a part of the wealth and nobility class. Really, he was just basically the most powerful noble. He happened to control the most powerful area of land, which happens to usually be a capital city or a large city, right? But in the Middle Ages, society was still divided, right? For example, in the very third order of society, this is in the Middle Ages. This is in the Middle Ages. What did I say? This is in the Middle Ages, right? So example is like the third order of society is those who work, those who pray, those who fight. And wealthy merchants were included in this third order of society. Now, nobles, on the other hand, were inside of the first order of society. And in this first order of society, they were still allowed to be considered above everyone else, even if they didn't have any money. All right. So like you have to understand that during the Middle Ages, social stratification and social class systems were super jacked up. Right. They were very, very messed up. But the thing about it is like also you had even lower classes of people. Here's a really interesting perspective about Renaissance Europe, right? So as the Renaissance period grows, did those social stratifications linger? Yes, they did, right? The king and the nobles were still a part of the ruling class of society. The middle class slash lower class was still a part of their society, and their lives did not change very much during the Euro European Renaissance period. Do not be naive thinking that because Michelangelo made the David means that like a poor person in France is going to be any richer because of it, right? That's not going to happen. Also, it kind of brought around this symbol of like honor. One kind of negative about the Renaissance is it brought up this idea of like dishonorable work, right? Or honorable work, okay? So an honorable work could be considered something like a merchant or a smith or a farmer, sort of. All right, the serfs were not really considered honorable because they were like some of the most subservient people. But, you know, you had honorable work. Becoming a priest, becoming involved in the Catholic Church was considered honorable. Whereas other jobs were considered super dishonorable, right? And this is not like necessarily a positive outcome of the Renaissance because you're stratifying people's work into what is morally right or wrong, right? Now, first of all, yes, a brothel owner still by modern day standards is not a very honorable career, right? Uh, but, and of course, a brothel being a place where someone could go meet a lady is what we're going to say. And then also an executioner, right? That's another great example of dishonorable work. That is why executioners would cover their face so they were not related to their job in post-Renaissance society. Also, the yellow bands that cities would force prostitutes to wear around their arms, which apparently symbolized the flames of hell that awaited them, right? So this honor structure is a little messed up because you're kind of disenfranchising other groups in society, trying to basically say that, like, what you do for a living is now going to judge you even in the afterlife. Like, so, like, this idea of honor coming out of the Renaissance period is kind of a little bit of a twisted concept, right? So the Renaissance culture, though, is going to continue to grow. And as it grew, classes and societies did begin to grow a little bit, right? There's a small, tiny, little middle class trying to grow the best it can, mostly made up of guild members and merchants and things like that. The nobility, surprisingly enough, is starting to shrink a little bit, right? A lot of that has to do with the fact that kings want more power, right? So that is huge. Underneath, nobility is beginning to shrink. It's because kings want more power, right? This is a big part of that new monarchies construct. So big thing going forward, though, is that this little tiny middle class is on the rise, and the ruling class desires more power, right? So a big part of this is some of our crazy elite banking families, like the $129 billion worth Medici family, is going to start issuing loans to kings and ruling class people. Now, this is interesting because we'll talk about later kind of how that outcome is like a little wonky, right? But banking families issuing loans to monarchs are going to help them grow their power and influence, right? So Renaissance culture is changing slightly, right? Yes, a little tiny middle class is trying to grow. And yes, a lower class is still a very lower class. And yes, slavery still has a prevalence. And yes, amongst those lower class, your job could be considered honorable or dishonorable. So it does have its negatives, right? But then another weird thing, like we said, was going on, that nobility class is starting to shrink a little bit, right? Because the kings want less 
nobles, right? And a lot of this has to do with the rise of those new monarchies, right? So, because political power is starting to shift. So you understand, during the Middle Ages, I know this is really annoying that we keep having to pop back to the Middle Ages to understand the Renaissance, but you can't really understand what the Renaissance without understanding where we came from, right? So political power was beginning to shift, okay? When you think of leaders of Europe, kings, queens, princes, duchess, dukes, uh, uh, earls, right? That's not just some guy's name. Uh, the big thing about it that you think of is you think of them as the ruling class as being uncompromisable, in charge, that is all, right? Now, the big thing was, is during the Middle Ages, that wasn't really the case. During the Middle Ages, there were wars, left and right, between nobles and rulers, right? Like, kings would have wars with nobles all the time, basically just trying to grow their power and influence. And nobles wanted to take kings down so they could install their family on the throne, right? So their family could control the large banking and mercantile and guild and economic center of a certain territory, right? And also the other thing about it is, is like nation states didn't even exist yet. Like these, like the United Kingdom didn't exist. There was the Kingdom of England and their borders could grow or shrink at any time, depending on who invaded them, right? So nobles were constantly fighting with rulers for more power. A good example of this is like the Hundred Years War, which was during the Middle Ages. Another example of this is the War of the Roses, where the Tudors become the affluent dominant family that comes out of that civil war to rule over England, right? Now, big thing about it, though, is in the rise of these new monarchies, they want more power. They want to create the image of themselves that you have of kings and queens. The Renaissance period is the rise of the ruling king and queen, right? Because they didn't really exist before that. They struggled with nobles for power. Remember, we talked about the investiture crisis, right? But here's the thing. If you're a king, right, or a queen, or a ruler of an area, and you want more power, there are two people that you have to squish their power down so that yours can rise up, right? There are three ruling classes of Europe, really, truly, during this time period. And it's the church, the nobility, and the kings and queens themselves, the monarchs, right? So if you want more power as a monarch, you must weaken the control of the church and of the nobles, right? Now, when you want to weaken the power of the nobles, there are a lot of methods that you could use to do this. You can install lesser nobles. You can try to pit nobles against each other. You can, for you can actually try to force noble families into exile. You can do a lot of these different things. But the hard one to kind of bring down is the church, right? The church has a reach of itself. It has like this idea of, oh, we choose the bishops and papal supremacy is the power that we hold and we have more power than even your kings do, right? They could instill riots. They could start rebellions. They could basically just excommunicate an entire country hoping that the people of that country will rise up and rebel against the king if they wanted to get rid of him, right? Well, the issue is you have to try and reduce some of that reach. You got to try and figure out a way to put the Pope's power in check. You've got to hold the church back with this hand and you have to push the nobles down with this hand, right? And the monarchs are going to do this, right? They're going to accomplish this. Now, are there some things in the way of this? Yeah, there are some obstacles for royals to do this. Two of them being the fact that it's hard to communicate with any allies nearby outside of them because there is no postal system, there is no telegraph, there is no messenger pigeon. They can't really send word very well. And also their militaries are really small. Now let's talk about why their militaries were so small really quick. Because their militaries were the nobles, right? Whenever a king during the Middle Ages wanted to go to war, he legitimately had to tell nobles to send their vassals and to amass an army for them, right? This concept of the professional army did not exist yet, right? So that is a huge issue. That is an obstacle for kings and queens. But the big thing about it is there are two people in particular that kind of ushered in this idea of a ruling class, right? The, as in being the king and dominant queen of a country, right? Particularly the queen, and we'll get to her in about two seconds. Because no one expects this era in Spain to pop up, known as the Spanish Inquisition period, right? So, so you understand, you don't really need to write this, you don't really need to write this, you don't really need to write this, it's not that big of a deal. This is actually more of a joke for, like, one of your parents. If any of your parents are Monty Python fans, just go up to them right now and say, apparently no one expects the Spanish Inquisition, and they'll probably laugh because they'll think it's hilarious. It's an old movie, okay? 
But the big thing about it is two leaders of Spain are going to become the first example of the new monarchs of Europe, right? They're going to become the examples of what a ruler and ruling family looks like. They are going to suppress the power of the nobles. They are going to push back the reach of the church. And they are going to become the legitimate dominant king and queen of Spain, right? So these new monarchies are important. This idea of a new monarchy, right? We talked about society and how that's changing. Nobility shrinking. Middle class is being born. Uh, how, like, it didn't really affect the lower classes. And how slavery was present even in this enlightened era of the Renaissance, which is really screwed up. But the struggle for power in Spain is very, really important, Okay. So it all starts with the marriage of two individuals, right? Isabella and Ferdinand of Spain, okay? Now, I'm sure some of y'all have heard about these two folks before. The reason why I always put Isabella first is because she happens to be a very dominant member of this relationship, right? She happens to be probably one of the biggest, bigger decision makers out of the couple, right? When it came to making decisions, Isabel had ju Isabella had just as much like fortitude and decision-making power as Ferdinand did, right? Which is a big example of that ruling unity, okay? So just so you understand going forward, when they came to power and were considered king and queen of Spain, Spain wasn't even a completely organized country, right? And a lot of it has to do with the fact that they were like a loose confederation of states, right? Like one area was Castile, the other one was like Catalonia, right? And there were these areas and they had nobles that ruled inside of them, right? And the big thing that the king and queen of Spain now, Isabel and Ferdinand, had to do is they got to figure out how do I reduce the power of these nobles that exist in all of these different states? Well, how about we do this? Let's stab them in the back. All right, so instead of allowing high-ranking nobles that ruled those states to be a part of royal councils, about taxation, and war, um, war councils and things like that, they were like, no, 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 no. Stay home, larger noble and they would, imp they would actually put lesser nobles into those positions, right? Currying the favor of these smaller nobles who are new to the ruling game, and then that way they are suppressing some of the power of the noble class. They also are going to be some of the first people to take loans out from some of these banking families, right? There were banking families everywhere. The Medici weren't the only ones. The Fuggers in Germany are one of them, right? The Habsburgs have banking ties, which actually <laughs> these two are related to, right? So, well, they will be by marriage, right? So anyway, so they decide to start taking loans from some of these banking families. Now, this is really good for the monarchs, right? And very good for the banks because they're growing business and they're actually creating a business platform for the banks. And it's very good for the monarchs because they're literally gaining basically free money, right? So the issue for the banks, though, is when the kings and the queens decide to not pay this money back, what are the banks going to do? Nothing, right? Like they have no ability, right? No ability to recollect these loans, which is a huge problem. And it's going to actually rear its ugly head later on when we get to things like revolutions in the 1700s. But just remember that a lot of the power of these like rulers is coming from these loans they're taking from these banking families, right? And they're using these loans to make larger armies. They're using these loans to outfit their armies. They're using these loans to try and grow their influence. They're using these loans to try and buy property from some of these greater nobles to reduce their effectiveness, right? So the church, though, was the big obstacle, right? How do you reduce the power of the Catholic Church? It all goes back to that investiture crisis, right? Isabella and Ferdinand decide to start appointing their own bishops that they choose, right? And a big thing that they're also going to do is they're going to try and curry the favor of these new bishops that they appointed and also the Spanish people by bringing the Inquisition under their own personal leadership. Just so you know what the Inquisition is, the Inquisition is a Catholic church court, right? It's a court or a panel of priests who decide if a person is a heretic or not, if they are speaking out against the church, right? And this entire thing leads to what is known as the Reconquista, right? The goal of this new Spanish Inquisition is this thing known as the Reconquista, right? So the big thing about it is the blah, 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 Isabella and Ferdinand begin to reduce the reach of the church by appointing their own bishops and telling the Pope that they are going to purify all of Spain. Because remember, Jews and Muslims lived in Spain 
prior to Isabella and Ferdinand taking the throne, right? So you remember, we talked about this at the very first flip in the summer assignment. The Muslim Empire spanned all of North Africa and went up into Spain, right? So the Reconquista was all about purging the rest of the Muslims out. If you look at this map real quick, you can actually see in 790, all the green is the Muslim influence and Muslim ruling, right? So they controlled this in 1790. By 900, their control is weakening, weakening, and then is basically completely gone. And this is that loose confederation of states, right? So in the Reconquista period, they decide to push all of the Muslims permanently out of southern Spain and push them back into North Africa through military action. But the other ones that are left behind is the Jewish community, right? The Jewish community, the community that is always, 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 constantly getting messed with during this entire time period, did remain. Because the Jewish community did not have allegiance to the Muslims, and they believed they didn't necessarily have allegiance to Isabella and Ferdinand. But the Spanish monarchy tells the Catholic Church, like, look, if you mind your own business and stay over there, I'll get a bunch of these Jewish people to convert to Catholicism, which is a big money play as well, because the Jewish community at the time also was very, very like insulated. They had their own uh, jobs. They were doctors and lawyers in a higher education status than most of the rest of Europe. So the Spanish monarchy decides to turn against the Jewish people, right? And they tell the Catholic priests that they appointed and the bishops, I want you to start having fiery sermons where you lash out against the Jewish community and you call them out for not being a part of our community. You call them out for this and you tell them that they're not allowed to have certain jobs anymore. And 40% of the Jews that lived in Spain at the time were forced to convert or were killed by the Inquisition. The ones who did convert were known as conversos, right? Conversos, okay? And these conversos claimed that they were actually Christian people, right? That they were Christian Catholics. But the problem was, is once this kind of reconquista, like, like actually was successful in a sense, right? They decide to then purge and expel all of the remaining Jews and then also place the conversos under their thumb. So you have to understand, is the resentment continued even after you forced a bunch of them to convert to Catholicism due to the fact that these new conversos, who everyone in Spain knew were former Jewish people, still held a lot of money, a lot of privilege, a lot of affluence, and a lot of, like, stake in their communities, right? So people of Spain still resented these conversos. So that's when the royals started the Spanish Inquisition, right? The main Spanish Inquisition to try and hunt down and punish these false Christians, right? They would try to see if conversos were still sticking to Jewish diets, right? If they were still keeping things kosher. They would see if, oh, are you eating pork now because you're a Catholic? Because you're allowed to do that. And they would, like, accuse a lot of these conversos of actually not living a Catholic lifestyle and still being secretly Jewish and trying to hold power over the Spanish people, right? In this process, 200,000 Jews lived in Spain before the Inquisition began and before the Reconquista. And by the end of it, 150,000 of them fled, only leaving 50,000 people or 50,000 Jews in all of Spain, right? Now, Isabella and Ferdinand would later have a daughter. That daughter would marry a Habsburg, and that Habsburgan daughter, Joanna, uh, would actually produce a guy named Charles V, which we will talk about later on, right? And so this is just an example, right? The Spanish Inquisition and the Reconquista is just an example of the growing affluence of these new monarchs, right? Because there are other new monarchs that are doing this very similar thing. Tudors in England under Henry VIII, the Valois in France, right? But it didn't have success everywhere, right? So the Tudors in England are growing their affluence, yes. The Valois in France are growing their affluence, yes. And they are creating this idea, like after Isabella and Ferdinand, of these big ruling classes. But the problem was that that wasn't happening everywhere because places like the Holy Roman Empire and the east of Europe didn't have a lot of success growing these massive monarchies, mainly because they were so fragmented, right? So I know this one was long and I know it was intense, but what I'm going to need you to do is maybe just go back and listen to it again just so you can understand what's going on. We'll talk about it a little bit more next time I see you. Y'all have a good one.